Okay, I think we can start. So good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or yeah, good evening, wherever you are. We're starting now session 10 with that is instruments and surveys. I would have a couple of things to tell you before we start with Brian's talk. And um, I want to remind you to upload uh, lightning talks in the Slack ch channel. That's very useful, especially for young people, uh, like PhD and postdocs, but in general for everyone. And we have uh, a kind of short morning because um, Melanie johnson Hollett won't make it for her talk, unfortunately. Uh, so we have extra time for questions. So everyone who has something to, to ask, please do not hesitate to put it in the Q&A uh, panel. And there's a coffee session at the end of the session. Uh, so please join there as well. And I think we are ready to start now with the invited talk by Brian Hare that will talk about lightning interferometry with LOFAR. So I leave you the stage. Thank you. Let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. Oh, one thing, Brian, do you want me mm -hmm. to tell you when you are 20 or 23 minutes? Uh, sure, that would be helpful. Okay, I'll give you a sign at 23. Great. So uh, as, uh, as Annalise was uh, saying, my name is Brian Hare. I'm a Veidi Fellow at the University of Groningen. And today I'm going to be talking about mine and my group's work using lightning uh, LOFAR to map lightning. So I am uh, not an astronomer. Uh, the only astronomy training I have is one undergraduate class that I barely remember. So I tend to think about things and use terminology very different uh, than this community does. So I'm going to just start at the top uh, and I'm going to start off by talking about some basics of lightning, a little bit of what we know and don't know, and then I'll try to build up to the science we are doing today, essentially. So this figure is what I made that just shows some of the basic processes in a lightning flash. We start off at the beginning, of course, with the distribution of charge in the cloud. Uh, eventually, this distribution gets strong enough, and there's strong enough electric fields that we get a uh, initial breakdown. This is a process where a region of air undergoes dielectric breakdown and turns into a conducting plasma. We don't know how this happens. There's a couple hypotheses, but there are no good observations uh, as of yet. Uh, so, but once it does, and so this is one of the biggest questions in lightning is how this occurs. Once you have a conducting plasma, uh, it will polarize in the electric field to get positive and negative ends. And these positive and negative ends will start to propagate and grow through the cloud. Uh, we call these plasma channels leaders. And so in this type of flash I show here, the positive leader is propagating through the cloud and the negative leader is propagating down towards ground. Uh, if about 10% of the lightning, uh, probably less than the Netherlands, we think, uh, actually it goes towards ground and attaches to ground, uh, when the lightning leader gets close to ground, if it does, there is an attachment process where small positively charged leaders will propagate up out of the ground. Eventually, the two will connect and it will be like a giant switch throw. And there will be a very large current pulse, uh, potentially over 50 kiloamps. That will start at the ground and propagate back up the channel in order to equalize the electric potential. This current pulse we call a return stroke and emits lots of energy in the form of light, heat, and sound. And this is the thing a traditional observer uh, associates with the flash. Um, the problem here is that most of these processes are, are not understood. We know that they happen. We do not know how they happen. Uh, specifically, initiation, how it started, and propagation, how it grows. Uh, we don't have, uh, and except for recently, as I'll talk about, we don't have any instrument that can resolve the meter scale physics of what goes on uh, inside the lightning flash. Cameras, for instance, can see, are really good at seeing stuff when they're very close, but they can't see stuff in the cloud. Um, and they can be really hard to interpret because luminosity is not equal to current. There can be many processes that cause a region of air to emit light. And just because you observe it with a camera does not mean that you know what actual process is happening. Our solution uh, to make progress here is LOFAR. 
LOFAR has meter scale location accuracy, as I'll show. We can observe the entire lightning flash, uh, we, whether it's in the cloud or not. And within its frequency regime, radio is directly proportional to current, which makes it, I'm not going to say easy in the absolute sense, uh, but a lot easier to interpret. So I want to compare sort of uh, what lightning looks like to uh, what we traditionally expect from astronomy. Again, I'm not an astronomer, uh, so please excuse me if I make any faux pas here. Um, but we use the transient buffer boards and we save out the raw voltages from the LOFAR uh, antennas. And this is at least my idea of what astronomy data looks like. It just looks like noise to my eyes. And you need beamforming if you pull, want to pull any information out of this. Uh, as opposed to lightning, which is very impulsive. Uh, you get these very strong spikes. Uh, and the time of arrival is very well defined. You can even start to pull physics out with your eyeballs. And so beamforming, we're looking into beamforming. I'll talk about that a little bit, but it's really not required. Now notice the time scale. Uh, we work in much shorter time scales uh, from, we have nanosecond timing accuracy uh, up to second long lightning flashes. So a second is the largest time scale I'm interested. So it's fascinating listening to these talks about minutes or hours or many, many hours of observations. And it's, it's uh, much bigger than I'm used to. Also notice just the range from a nanosecond up to a second. That's nine orders of magnitude of interest in time. And this is a big theme with LOFAR is that there's just this huge nine orders of magnitude in time that are, of, that are of interest and there's four orders of magnitude in space, tens of kilometers down to our meter scale resolution. We'll talk about again more later. And so low far, once we make these images that'll show, you could just keep zooming in. You get this big picture of lightning, you just go in and in and in and it shows more and more detail and, uh, and it's amazing. So uh, what we do with the time, once you know the pulse time and you know the antenna location, so in this diagram, imagine the little triangles or the antennas, you know the location time, you can just solve Pythagorean's theorem and you can find the location, the sky, uh, where the source comes from, assuming a point source, which works 99% of the time. Uh, the trick is, the, the problem is that lightning has many of these pulses. So here I've zoomed out one order of magnitude, this is 50 microseconds, and you can already see there's many, many of these pulses. Even if you were to zoom into one of these spikes, it's not just one pulse when you see one spike here, it's many pulses in here. And these pulses often overlap and lightning is it within what we call the confusion limit. That is the antennas are on all sides of lightning. We use the core stations and the remote stations. And so the order between the, uh, the pulses will change between the antennas. So you can't rely upon the order to match up which pulses go together. You can't rely upon the shape of the magnitude because that changes. And so solving this confusion problem is very hard. Uh, and now we have recently, within the last year-ish, uh, actually come up with a good solution for this, inspired by Kalman filters. It's an iterative solution. We start off with just one LOFAR station on the super turf, uh, and we use the station we pick, you know, this is the particular, we loop over every pulse in the flash. Uh, we say this is the pulse we want to locate. We start off with one station, and you can only get a direction to that pulse. We sort of convert that into a rough 3D XYZT, so 4D, uh, uh, guess location in the sky, where we think this is coming from. You then go to the next closest station. You use the guess to then figure out what the correct pulse is. You use that pulse to then update the guess location. You go to the next station, use guess location, find the pulse, use the pulse, update the location. And you just keep looping over every station. We go through the super turp, we go through all the core stations, and then we go through all the remote stations. Once you have included all remote stations, uh, we have meter level accuracy. Uh, either it's one meter or two meters, we're still debating. You do this for every pulse in the lightning flash and you get this. I hope this plays well over Zoom. This is uh, my favorite lightning flash animated in three dimensions. Each one of these dots is a located radio pulse. The white, the yellow ones are the ones that happen right now. 
and the white ones are sort of uh, left behind to give an integrated view of the whole flash. Uh, and so, and it's rotating to give you, try to give a sense of the three-dimensional structure. Uh, you can, even from your eyeballs, uh, this, uh, you could see lots of new physics here if you uh, look closely. Already, so if you just look closely, you can see all this very filamentary structure we could pull apart. You can even tell the difference between the positively charged and negatively charged uh, leaders or plasma channels. In this figure, um, the negative ones, I'll talk about this a little more to you, uh, later on, the negative ones are sort of on the lower half. Uh, you can tell them because they, the VHF emission comes from the tether. So these are all negative leaders. And you can tell because you can see them growing. Where the positive leaders tend to come towards the top. Um, and you can tell them because they flicker. You can't see the tip of the positive leader. So the stuff at the top right now, that's all positive leaders right now. You can't see the tip. Instead, the VHF seems to come along the body of the positive leader. And so this has been one uh, big theme in our research group is try to understand where this VHF is coming from, why it looks the way it does in the lighting. Uh, okay, so this is the uh, same flash, same data, but now just projected onto a bunch of 2D planes. The top plot uh, shows the most physics right off the bat, height versus time. Again, each dot is the, so the location of one of these VHF pulses in four dimensions, space and time. And color in this plot shows time. Uh, and that's the same with all my plots from, from now on out. So in this plot, uh, and then you also have a plan view, so it's top down, uh, which you can't see a lot here, it just looks pretty. And you have two side views. In the height versus time, you can see the lightning flash starts at zero kilometer, uh, zero t equals zero. You have negative leaders that start to propagate between two to four kilometers in height altitude. Eventually, uh, that's NL is negative leaders. A negative leader goes to ground. So this is a cloud to ground flash, connects with the ground and produces a return stroke. The return stroke is at 70 milliseconds in this plot. So that's the vertical bar you see labeled RS. It looks, it's actually going upwards. And if you zoom in, you can see the upward growth, uh, but it looks like a vertical bar here because it goes so fast. Uh, the positive leaders in this plot are between, they look like a horizontal band between four to five kilometers altitude. And I'll zoom in on this more. So some basic specs, uh, our algorithm uh, is really our limiting factor at this point. It can locate over 200 VHF location, source locations per, mil, per millisecond of data. The next best system is about 100 per millisecond. Our current algorithm, I think our actual algorithm is actually a little bit better than this now, but it's about 120 nanoseconds minimum between sources. Uh, it can't sustain that because it gets confused, but if there's a couple sources that are 120 nanoseconds apart, it can locate them versus the next best is a full microsecond. And the next best has a horizontal accuracy at best of like 50 meters uh, where we have one meter accuracy and they can only do it in 2D. Now, I don't want to disparage these other groups too much. They do do really good science, and I wish I had time to go into what they've been learning. Uh, but the images they make just, uh, low far as orders of magnitude, the best system in the world. Now I'm gonna zoom in and talk a little bit more about the science we see. This is an animation, again, I hope this shows up well in Zoom, uh, zoomed in on a negative leader. Uh, now, we, of course, we can't measure charge with LOFAR directly. Instead, what we do is we know from previous work uh, that has measured the charge that the leader looks like this in VHF if it's negative and that if it's positive and they look very different. And so we use that. It's sort of like a proxy to tell what the charge is. And they look so different, it's impossible to confuse the two. This is a negative leader. And again, you can tell because you see VHF coming your fifth, you see a growing thing if you, uh, uh, show it in time. Um, and I'll show a similar zoom for positive leader later on. So now if you, again, the thing with LOFAR, you can just keep zooming in. So let's zoom in again to this bit of the negative leader. Uh, and what we see is something like this. And this is already fascinating. And the reason is, is because on negative leaders, each one of these dots is a pulse we see bursts of pulses. 
This is interesting because in optical, we know that negative leaders, uh, they're, they're discrete. They don't grow continuously, they grow what we call steps. There's these big jumps, five to 10 meters. And it turns out we see that in VHF, uh, and that tells us a lot about the physics of what's going on. And it's not just one pulse per step, it's a burst of pulses per step. So there must be lots of, every time there's a step, there's a lot of little impulsive things that go off at once, it's quiet, everything moves forward, and then all of a sudden there's all these impulsive events. We think those are streamers and other class of physics I don't have time to get into. Um, so this is one of our uh, uh, big works we've done and this we were able to publish in PRL. Now I'm gonna talk about what we've discovered for positive leaders. I'm kind of going backwards. Uh, this work uh, was done before the negative leader work. I just thought for didactic reasons, it worked better to go backwards. So this is an animation of the positive leader. And notice you can't see the tip of the positive leader. The tip of the positive leader is invisible to us in VHF. There are now two groups that claim to be able to see the tip of the positive leader and they are going to present their work at a conference next week. So I'm very interested in that, but this is not a trick we've, I've bothered to try to pull off yet. I'm sure we could if they can do it. I just haven't done it. Uh, instead, you notice the VHF, if you look at this, it, uh, it, the positive leader looks like it's twinkling like a Christmas tree. The VHF comes all along the body and it's only after a long period of time you get this integrated view, do you finally actually see the shape of the leader. And what we have saw, seen is that the shape has structure. It's not just a channel thing. There's these long, thin structures on the positive leader. No one else at the time has the, had the resolution to see these. Uh, they're very thin. They're thinner than our resolution. So this resolution image uh, limited in width. And they're very short for lightning, 10 to 100 meters long. We call them needles, uh, and uh, we were able to publish this in Nature. Uh, and we think this could explain, I talked before about these return strokes. It turns out that I only talk about one, but lightning can have many return strokes. It can keep attaching to ground, sometimes over 10 return strokes in a flash. And one of the mysteries is why doesn't the channel stay hot between return strokes? Uh, why do you need multiple return strokes? Why doesn't the first one just discharge everything and you're done for the day? We think that needles could play, it's just a rough hypothesis right now, but we think they could uh, act like capacitors and they store up charge and they really increase uh, the non-linearity of the flash. They make it more unstable. And so that's why you, get, they, you wind up with multiple return strokes. Since this work, we're really excited because these have absolutely now been observed with, by two other groups. One of them in VHF, they had to pull a trick to get enough resolution. They had to go to, uh, uh, 150-ish, I don't remember the number, but well, 150-ish megahertz to get enough resolution to actually see these. And there's still not just barely enough resolution to see the needles. And they were able to confirm all our measurements, uh, saw a couple new things that we uh, didn't have time to really investigate. So that was really cool. Um, they've also now, I'm really excited about this, been seen in optical. Again, completely confirmed everything that we saw and even confirm some of the things that we guessed should happen. So I'm very proud of that. And now we have, I just uh, sent in for review, another work uh, since the Nature article has to be short, uh, a new work, 30 pages long, going into all sorts of fancy detail on how these needles act. Uh, so now that's sort of the bread and butter of our science. Why does lightning emit VHF? How does it grow? So what's next? Uh, what we want to look into is first is we want to look into polarization. LOFAR is of course a polarized uh, thing. Um, there, it's the, there's only one other polarized lightning instrument out there and it only has three antennas. So we're in pretty good shape to do this. Uh, and we haven't used this polarization information yet. So we really want to do this. Uh, we can pull up, use this to pull up the direction of the sources and hopefully this will also help us disentangle interfering pulses because right now we rely upon essentially time of arrival. So two pulses overlap, it causes problems. And hopefully this will help with that. The difficulty is that our lightning, the radio signals come in at near horizon incidents. 
that is all of y'all are used to looking straight up and that's where uh, of course Lofar is designed to look straight up we look at 10 to 20 degrees from the horizon which makes things interesting uh, also we're looking into beam forming now uh, this is very important in order to really dig down into the noise of course um, and it's also useful when time of arrival starts not working, when you have so many pulses that you don't see pulses anymore, you just see stuff. Uh, so we need beam forming, of course, to pull that apart. Uh, we have a PhD student in the United States working on this. And this is our very first beam formed data. This uh, may not look very impressive to you, uh, but to the lightning community, this is gold. And we think this could be another nature paper. We're still working on this, still early in the project. But we just essentially, this is using core stations and uh, this is beam form. So we just delay uh, the signals and add them together. Uh, this is of course all post-processing because this is TBB data. Um, and one of these pictures that you see here is just azimuth and zenethyl angle. Uh, and you see this uh, source that's moving upwards. As far as we can tell, we haven't figured out how to do cleaning yet. Uh, we have to be very careful again because our data could be, it's much more broadband uh, and there could be 3D issues. So we have, to be, we have to make sure we really move forward in baby steps. So we haven't gotten to cleaning just yet. But you see a source that moves upwards here. This is the very, very first VHF emitter in the lightning flash. So the fact that it moves upwards is uh, telling us this is actually positive charge. We can tell that because we also know the direction electric fields based upon other measurements. And that already gives us uh, strong clues of how the lightning gets initiated. So we're very excited. The three different panels are three different, are plus and minus 200 meters. This just shows that if we just use the core, uh, we have no sensitivity to distance, which is fine for now. The top panel uh, shows the beamform trace at zero, zero. So red is the data from power from one antenna that's normalized on CS002. And the green shows the beamform trace. And it just shows that we can dig down in the noise by two orders of magnitude. Keep in mind, we only use six antennas per station. So we don't have as much sensitivity as uh, using all the LOFAR. But still, digging down by any orders of magnitude in light need is a big step forward. And given already, uh, even without doing this low far, is super sensitive compared to other lightning instruments. And you see uh, the black bar, which is the point in time where this image is, you can see this ramp up in power. So as the source moves upwards, it's the power it's emitting is increasing exponentially. So we're now struggling to really interpret this. And uh, we're really excited about this work. So now I want to talk a uh, step back, talk a little bit more about the instrument itself. Why is LOFAR so darn good at lightning? First is the uh, frequency band. 30 to 80 megahertz is the correct band to observe lightning. Uh, lightning drops off in amplitude at higher frequencies, so you don't want to go too high. But, uh, of course, higher frequencies give you better resolution, so you don't want to go too low. And 30 to 80 megahertz, as far as we know, is the best uh, compromise between the two. Larger bandwidths are, of course, better, but 30 to 80 megahertz is where you want to be, and then you can increase from there. Of course, you need the transient buffer boards. We do things very differently than standard astronomy observations, so we have to have the raw data. And we're still figuring out how to map lightning in the best way to do that. So we have to have the raw data so we can experiment with different algorithms. You, of course, have to have omnidirectional antennas because you don't know what direction the lightning flash is going to be. Um, this makes it, so for example, we haven't even tried using the HBA tiles of LOFAR uh, because uh, you have to beam form them ahead of time. Uh, and they're higher frequency, so we're not, we're not certain the best way of doing that. Uh, Dual polarized, of course, is very important. We haven't gotten around using it just yet, but we're really excited about that. An extremely stable clock. Every low far station has uh, a, uh, a uh, atomic clock. That may not be a new thing in astronomy. I imagine this is now quite common for, for uh, 
uh, telescopes to do this. But this is entirely unique in the field of lightning. Light inside us are poor. We have a very small field, like a three antenna interferometer is top of the line. So having it at top- 33 minutes, 23 minutes. Thank you. Um, so having an atomic clock, it really gives us this one nanosecond stability over a whole second, and th this really helps. Um, the stability is what's important. Once you have the stability, we can use the lightning itself to calibrate any other timing offsets in the system. So our timing uh, is then limited by SNR, essentially, and we get one nanosecond accuracy. Even if the initial calibration isn't that good, we can improve, use lightning to recalibrate everything we want. Uh, the wide range of baselines is critical. The one meter baselines are what really help us uh, get the initial imaging going. Uh, that lets us solve the uh, confusion limited problem where the 100 kilometer baselines combined with the one nanosecond timing accuracy is really gives us a one meter uh, resolution. And lastly, of course, it's important there's enough lightning. There's not a massive amount of lightning in the Netherlands, but there's a couple big storms. And so we get, a, uh, we get now probably about 20 flashes a summer and we're getting better. Even from one lightning flash, we get more data than any other lightning group gets from a whole storm. Uh, so you need some lightning, but we don't need a massive amount. Now, if I'm thinking, how would I, if I had infinite money and manpower, how would I improve LOFAR? just dreaming here, not, not worry about logistics. Or, uh, first, of course, is wider frequency band uh, would be the core, is always nice. Uh, better near horizon response, again, because signals can 10 to 20 degrees from her, above horizon. I don't know how you would optimize an antenna to look at horizon signals, but this is the direction I would start thinking. More 10 to 100 kilometer baselines, this would give us better resolution. And more bit depth, at least I think. Uh, it turns out LOFAR saturates on the, the digitizer specifically, saturates on the strongest uh, pulses we see from lightning. It's not a big problem. We don't lose a lot of data. It's, uh, but it's a mildly annoying sort of thing and I rather wish it didn't do that. So if you had more bit depth, you could increase, you could keep your digitizer sensitivity the same, but increase the maximum uh, uh, voltage that you're able to sense. At least uh, that's the way my non-technical brain thinks to maybe need a different solution. But just if I were to throw money at LOFAR, this is what I would want. Now, what about other instruments? Uh, what possibility is there, uh, particularly thinking of SCA low, to observe lightning? Uh, to put it in a sentence, I am cautiously optimistic about SCA for observing lightning. The one, the thing that really excites me is the high bandwidth, 50 to 30 me 350 megahertz. Of course, higher frequencies allow us for better resolution. So that's always exciting. And uh, it allows, uh, you can then really start to think about testing the frequency dependence of source emission models, which we haven't really tried to do with LOFAR yet. Of course, one problem is the lack of source emission models, but that's another problem. Uh, but if you have this high bandwidth, you can really start to think about uh, really in-depth exploring the frequency dependence of the VHF emission and how that changes. Or is there a difference between low frequency emitters and high frequency emitters? Uh, the antenna response is a good question. Again, we need good near horizon response. Uh, I've had a very quick, not qual uh, qualitative look at the published uh, antenna response, and it looks promising. Uh, it's just, it seems to be around as effective as LOFAR. Again, just my eyeballs, nothing qual quantitative. So that looks promising. Uh, the sensitivity, SCAS, my understanding is that SCAS major selling point is the huge number of antennas and high sensitivity. This, I'm going to be honest, is not exciting for me at the moment because we only use six antennas uh, per station with LOFAR. So we're not even using LOFAR's full sensitivity at the moment. Maybe in a couple of years, uh, we're really gonna start to need SCA's sensitivity, but I don't know. Uh, I just don't know at the moment how sensitive you need to go to continue to do lightning science. Um, again, maybe you need it, maybe you don't, I don't know. 
Uh, some things that worry me about potentially using SCA is the maximum baseline. Of course, we know that the lower maximum baselines uh, could result in lower accuracy, but it could also be that this compensates is compensated for by the higher band, uh, higher frequency band. I, or maybe if you get lightning that's really close, that it doesn't even matter anyway. Or maybe it's only a factor two and you have two meter resolution instead of one. I don't know. This is uh, something I'm really interested in looking into. Transient buffer boards. I know there will be transient buffer boards, but I have, uh, uh, I'm not really very, uh, haven't really been able to find a lot of information on this. I don't know how, it's really important that they're flexible. You could say multiple, low far say is five seconds of data and we need all five uh, because of trigger delays. Brian, I have to ask you to go to the conclusion slide. Ah, uh, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> One more sentence. Uh, I, the five lead last part is about lightning, skull lows in a desert. I don't know how much lightning there is. So uh, I am cautiously optimistic for ska. It could be very useful uh, for lightning. It would be nice to have a good competitor for low far. Uh, it's not a good state to be the top tier in the field with no competitors. Um, and so, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian. We have some questions. I'm going to read them. First one is from Jean Mathias Grismaier and is uh, How many stations did you use for the Beam Formed movie? Uh, the Beam, I don't remember the number. Uh, it's all core stations, but six uh, antennas per core station. I think there's, what, 34 core stations? It might not all be the entire core, but it should be a large portion of the core. I don't remember the exact number. I did, again, it's not my work. It was a PhD student that made the movie. Okay, thanks. Next question is, um, how do the spectra of the lightning look, look like? Uh, we don't know. Uh, the problem there, it, it's very, very flat. And so the question is, how flat? The problem is, is pulling out uh, the antenna function. And in order to do that, you really have to trust the LOFAR's antenna function at near horizon incidence. And near horizon incidence is tricky because all of a sudden you get reflections from other antennas. Uh, the ground, make sure the ground is modeled perfectly is important. Um, so this is not something we've put a lot of effort into the moment, but the best uh, at the moment, the best I could say is very flat. Okay, I think we have the last one from George Miley is, um, well, everybody's, is, well, you read that, they're saying great stuff, Brian, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> and George is saying, I'm trying to push for expansion of the ILT on the long term to North Africa and the Middle East. Would lightning studies down to lower latitudes be interesting? Are there any differences between the properties of lightning in the tropics? Yes. I... Yeah, uh, there are big differences. I don't even know how, where to start. Um, yeah, uh, there are big differences. So er, the question is, is what it looks like. Of course, uh, for our the way we do lightning mapping here, um, to really get the world best sensitivity that we have with the, with the, in the Netherlands, you have to have the core and the remote stations. Uh, but one station, like if you just have the Super Turk or something of the size of the Super Turk, or even if you don't have as many antennas, uh, will still give you, will still be competitive. You can only do things in 2D, but it'd still be competitive with the other, because uh, again, the next best system in the world is three antennas or six antennas. I think the, they're the most latest interferometer that's not low far, six antennas. So you could still do be really competitive. And uh, I know that, the and yeah, the lightning does look very different depending on latitude. And I know that uh, lower latitude lightning is much more energetic. Uh, we think it initiates differently than the stuff maybe, uh, than the stuff does in the Netherlands. Uh, certainly charge structures are different. So uh, that might be interesting. Okay, thanks. There are some more questions, so either we can discuss it during the, the coffee session oh. or I encourage Brian to type the answer uh, himself. Okay. Great. Uh, and I'll, I'll stay on for the coffee session. Let's see here. How do I exit? I'm going to okay. exit. Okay.
Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention at the beginning, it's good if everyone can write the name of the person to whom they want to make the questions if we read it later. Okay, so start with the, the name of the person who you want to you ask something to. Okay, so thanks, Brian. Uh, very nice talk, very impressive movies as well. Now we go on with uh, Leah Morabito. Okay, and Leah, sorry, okay, is going to tell us about sub second, sub arc, arc second imaging at megahertz frequencies, the power of LOFAR. And you have 17 minutes. Shall I tell you when 15 is when you are at 15? Um, yeah, sure, that's fine. Okay, great. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you. My name is Leah Morabito, and uh, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to tell you about um, this amazing power of LOFAR. So we've already heard at this conference a lot about what LOFAR can do, and a lot of variety as well about what LOFAR can do. And this is one more thing that makes LOFAR really unique, is its power to do sub arc second imaging and megahertz frequencies. So just to remind people, that LOFAR has a lot of stations in the Netherlands, but there are also stations spread all across Europe. And it, the instrument is so flexible, but one of the things that you can do is you can correlate the data from all of these stations together. And what does that get you? Well, let's compare with the LOFAR two meter sky survey, which uses just the core and remote stations in the, in the Netherlands. And that gets you about six arc second resolution at 150 megahertz. But by extending to the rest of the stations in the array, um, doing what we call LOFAR VLBI, you can actually beat the best ground based seeing for, with optical telescopes using adaptive optics um, at a, 150 megahertz. You get 0.3 arc second resolution. So that's really phenomenal. So radio telescopes at higher frequencies can also achieve this kind of resolution. So why do it at low frequencies? Well, first of all, 85% of the sources and lots are unresolved at six arc seconds, which means you're missing out on the morphological information. So high resolution at low frequencies provides you with that morphological information, but it also provides you with spatially resolved spectral information, which we saw yesterday from Sarah's talk, is really important to have this broadband frequency coverage. Um, and you need to do it on a spatially resolved scale to understand the spectral aging properties of a, a particular source. You can reach fainter populations because the typical synchrotron spectral index means things are brighter at low frequencies. And you can actually you can access intrinsic um, Sorry, it says low Z, but I meant low, low frequency. You can access intrinsic low frequencies at high redshift, which you just cannot do with any other telescope with this kind of resolution. Um, and the other thing that really helps out is survey speed. So LOFAR has with, if, if you're doing LOFAR VLBI, you have a field of view of about five degrees square, which if you're wanting to survey the sky at sub arc second resolution with a radio instrument, you just, this is, this is gonna be the fastest way to do it. However, it is very challenging to do this. So you're combining signals for, from you know, tens of thousands of dipoles. Um, the data volume, when you're including all of these stations, which increases your number of baselines, um, are huge. They're usually from 4 to 20 terabytes. It depends on whether the data has been uh, disco compressed. Uh, the clocks, we heard about the clocks in the previous talk. Uh, the independent station clocks have to be synchronized. And the, the clocks for the international stations um, are not on the same the, are, are independent, um, whereas this clocks for the core stations are, are all on the same, or this core stations are all on the same clocks. Um, with baselines up to 2000 kilometers, that means you have lower tolerance for errors in your correlator model. And the ionosphere can be wildly varying uh, with larger impact for the longer baselines. So you can imagine that the ionosphere over the Netherlands can vary, but if you're talking about uh, the low fire station in the UK versus the low fire station in Poland, uh, you can have just completely different ionospheres over those, those um, stations. Another problem is that we need kind of Goldilocks calibrators. So when people do VLBI at higher radio frequencies, they need things that are, are compact on sort of micro arc second scales and bright enough at high frequencies. But here with LOFAR, we need things that are compact on sort of 10 tenths of arc second um, scales and bright enough for LOFAR. And we just don't have any information, or we didn't um, have any information when we started about what, what these sources were like and where they were. And then another problem is that not everything is a point source. So when you're self-calibrating, 
a point sources are great. You have lots of, you know, you have the same signal to noise theoretically on every single baseline, but when you move to low far field BI, then you're starting to lose, reduce your signal to noise because you're losing the signal because you don't have as much flux on the compact scales that are visible to the longer baselines. And so we really have to struggle to get enough signal to noise uh, to, to calibrate these baselines. So how do we deal with this? There's two things that we need. We need information on calibrator sources and we need a specialized calibration strategy to handle this. So, th so over the last few years, we have conducted the Long Baseline Calibrator Survey. So this has been led by Neil Jackson and others, um, and it's finally complete now. Uh, so they selected sources that were bright at low frequency with a flat low frequency spectral index, as this was an indication of compactness. Um, using multi-beaming of, of groups of 30 beams with three megahertz bandwidth and three, three minutes each, surveyed all of these candidate sources. Um, and this is finished a few months ago and has about 25,000 calibrator sources. So the map here shows you the density of sources and where it's black, that's surrounded by the yellow. Um, in, this, in this area, you have more than one good calibrator per square degree. So this is, all of this should be absolutely fine to calibrate. And then the other portions are slightly less, um, slightly less okay, but, but still have good calibrators, just the density is not quite as high. So this calibrator survey calls, covers all of the northern sky, except around Cassay and Sige, which are bright 18 sources, and it's just, it's just too much to be able to calibrate there. Uh, we have good coherent statistics out to baselines of, of, on all of the baselines in the array, which go up to about 2,000 kilometers. And the end result of this is there's generally about one good calibrator per square degree, which it turns out is about what you need uh, to be able to calibrate the array. Uh, so taking a look at some of the coherence statistics that have come out of this uh, survey. So this is the fraction of time where the time is less than the coherence time versus the coherence time. And this is a comparison basically of how much, um, how much coherence you have in your phases on different baseline lengths. And so the short baselines are, <clears throat> are the blue and the um, going up to the, uh, the red, which are the longest baselines. And you can see that there's actually not a huge difference here, which is really good. So the coherence time is worse on longer baselines as these curves are for a given coherence time, the curves for the longer baseline are more to the left, but the effect is not huge like we thought it might, might be. Um, and the nice thing with the long baseline calibrator survey is some of the calibrator sources have been observed more than once, which gives us uh, reproducibility statistics. And so this is the cumulative fraction of the difference in the signal to noise parameter uh, for the different stations. Um, and the Irish station is the most recently added to the array, which is why this curve is, is the lowest because there's just fewer statistics here to make these curves. But everything is looking really good with the long baseline calibrator survey. So great, we have information on calibrator sources. We know that um, we can calibrate with them, but now what? So we've developed a calibration strategy for high resolution imaging at less than 200 megahertz. And we've done this building on some VLBI techniques. In particular, we've, um, we've built on the idea of fringe fitting, <clears throat> which estimates both the delay and the rate in addition to the phase errors. So delay is just how phase changes with frequency and rate is how phase changes with time. And by estimating both of these, in addition to the, the phase, you can extend your amount of data that you're using to solve for your phase errors, which increases your signal to noise. The one problem is that fringe fitting does not account for dispersive effects, which means that the phase varies non-linearly with frequency. So you can see here in this plot, um, this is phase versus frequency, uh, and this is, the ionosphere really impacts this. It's non, it's a dispersive delay, it's a dispersive effect, which means your phases vary non-linearly here. So when we started building this calibration strategy, fringe fitting as implemented in apes only fit for linear changes of phase with frequency. And so this is something that we've had to deal with. And this has been the major, um, major issue here. But we've, we've successfully dealt with this, and there's a LOFAR VLBI pipeline. We had a major software release earlier this year, um, and the paper will be submitted shortly. <clears throat> and it's available online freely, um, and you can go and look at the, the documentation if you're interested. Okay, so just to give you a demonstration of this, this is uh, pointing 205 plus 55 from the LOFAR 2-meter sky survey. It's a typical survey field with several 
sort of Jansky level sources. This here is the delay calibrator, and this is the, the LOFAR VLBI image of it. Um, so the scale bar there is, is three arc seconds. And then you can see the other uh, calibrators in the field. So all of these are LBCS calibrators um, that have been picked out of the catalog as likely candidates to be good. So when you're looking at this field, that blue circle here is actually the limit of the field of view of the international stations. So testing a couple things outside of the field of view just to see how it worked, you can see that this one, which we didn't really expect to work very well, has not. It also has the lowest peak flux density out of all of these sources. And this one is kind of okay because it's a little brighter. This one may look like it didn't work here in the bottom left-hand corner, but it actually turns out this source is about 20 arc seconds large. It's a, an FR2 type source. And the hotspots of this FR2 are actually detected with um, low far VLBI. So that's quite cool. And this is something that you could, you could absolutely do science with. So you can take the solutions, the phase solutions and the uh, dispersive delay solutions that we, we find for these uh, long baseline calibrator sources and transfer them to other sources in the field and make images. And so here's just a selection of some of the sources in these field. We find that we can get down to about 100 microjansky RMS noise and typically with a 0.3 by 0.4 arc second beam. Um, and it takes about 30,000 CPU hours to do uh, about 100 sources. Okay, <clears throat> so this is what the pipeline can give, you, can give you, and all of these images here were generated in an automated way, um, so with no human intervention for, for self-calibration or cleaning. So now that the pipeline is, is producing such nice images, we're pushing towards uh, having a low-fire VLBI paper splash um, which, with submission um, shortly, uh, and this is using a low-fire VLBI pipeline to process individual science targets so there's about 10 to 12 projects that are part of this paper splash, mostly led by uh, the long baseline working group members who have been helping develop this calibration strategy. And I thought I would just give some highlights here. So the science topics cover things like jets. This is 3C273, where here Sean Mooney has made a LOFAR image and he's comparing this with uh, the HST image and looking at the, the knots um, um, in this jet, uh, comparing the radio to the the, uh, the optical and then also to the x-ray. Also gravitational lensing. So this is 0751, this gravitational lens. And Shruti Badol has been working with Neil Jackson on this. And here's the high resolution model of the, the lens. And then they will deproject this and get an intrinsic source plane image of, uh, of this, radio, um, this radio AGM. Uh, so Christian Grunewald at, uh, at Leiden is also working with the LBA. So all of the results I've shown so far have been with the HBA at 150 megahertz, but you can still get sub arc second resolution um, at 55 megahertz. And that's what, what Christian has done here. This is 3C196. And here he's comparing the LBA to the S band and this is a spectral index map. Uh, so Pranav Kukreti has been working on 3C293. So it's this uh, large extended source, but it's a question of what's going on in the center here. And using LOFAR VLBI, you can see that there are maybe some younger jets here. And so Pranav's been looking at the, the spectral energy distributions of these um, knots in particular and, and the inner lobes, which have turnovers in their spectra, which is consistent with free free absorption and the Western lobe receding. And so all of this work is consistent with uh, showing that there's jet ISM interactions um, as traced by ionized outflows seen in ancillary data at other wavelengths. This is a source that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I worked on the source in the LBA um, and Fritz Svein has now um, made an HBA image, which critically gives us a fifth point of, of um, data on the spectral energy distribution to do spectral energy modeling. And it's just a, a beautiful, beautiful source. And you can even see the flat spectrum core in this, uh, in this image. And this is a high redshift galaxy. This is at a redshift of 2.4. So having this high resolution imaging at the low frequencies is really critical to, to really constrain the intrinsic spectrum of this source. And so here's are his results, which you should hopefully see uh, shortly as part of this paper splash. Um, so he's found uh, the initial conditions for the spectral modeling gives the, the magnetic field, um, which is strong, but close to the, the CMB. Um, and so here's the, the spectral index is the top and the spectral age is the, the bottom. And then on the, the right is the, uh, the errors, I think. Yes. 
Okay. So ongoing work that we're working on, um, in addition to all of these individual projects that have been pro um, progressing, is post-processing lots. So the LOFAR 2 meter sky survey, the data is recorded with all of the stations, but currently we're only processing the Dutch stations. Um, so we can go back and post-process with the international stations to get sub-arc second resolution. The field of view is limited by the data averaging and station beams. And this figure here shows you the pointing strategy for lots. But even conservatively, if we can accept a 20% uh, reduction in intensity, we have a decent field of view um, that joins almost with the, the next pointing. So we can get pretty good sky coverage. And essentially what you do, you post process lots, and then for every field you get um, sources, you get high resolution image of, images of the sources in those fields. So this will really be the first subarc second wide area radio survey. And by wide area, I mean entire northern sky. Uh, so the, the things that we're working on now is processing more fields to test and optimize the pipeline, building a framework for selecting sources of interest, um, and also a framework for the delivery of, of final images. And so just based on uh, the, the source counts from the SCAD simulations, you can predict using a sensible data rate, sort of how many sources you might expect to see as a function of time as we start post-processing post lots. So Fritz has also been working on a uh, wide field BLBI. So this is taking a single pointing and doing the entire image, uh, the entire- yeah, Three minutes to go. Okay, thanks. And, and doing the entire image at 0.3 arc second resolution. So the pipeline produces postage stamp images, but Fritz has been working on doing um, the entire field of view um, as one image. And so this is what it, part of the Lachman hole looks like at six arc seconds. And this is what it looks like at 0.3 arc seconds. So you, you're increasing your sensitivity because you're adding stations and then you get to see the morphology, the, the wonderful morphology of all of these sources. This is really, really beautiful work. Um, it is quite logistically challenging as this single eight hour observation took him about uh, a quarter of a million CPU hours to do. Uh, and so one of the things that we'll need to do going forward is, is starting to optimize this. But if you're interested in learning more about this, please uh, see Fritz's lightning talk, which he's posted on the channel this morning. Okay, so I'll just summarize by saying that LOFAR VLBI, this, this sub arc second uh, resolution imaging is really gaining traction because the pipeline has been, um, is, is now, uh, com well, complete, but needs op some optimization, but the pipeline is functional um, and people are using it to, to do science. Um, um, and because of this, and because the processing is largely automated, that means that we should expect to see a lot more science coming out um, using sub second, the subarc second capabilities of LOFAR in the very near future. So this paper splash of 10 to 12 projects will really demonstrate the capabilities of the pipeline and LOFAR and at, hopefully advertise it to the broader community. Um, and the ongoing efforts for both the wide field imaging um, and the surveying are the focus now, and there's lots of growth in these areas in the near future, so stay tuned. Okay, thank you, and I'm uh, happy to take questions. Yeah, many thanks, Leah. Very impressive images, as also some people wrote in the in the chat. So we have a question from Pratik Davade, uh, asking, yeah. how are you building the framework for selecting sources of interest? So that's uh, basically, well, okay, so there's, there's two, two, this could be two questions. It could be what is the, the technical technicalities of building the framework or what sources of interest are we, are we selecting? Um, so it's to build the framework is fairly straightforward. Essentially, you just need something that says, here's a list of sources, these are the pointings, and then we need to pull the data and process it and process these, um, make postage stamp, postage stamp images of all these um, uh, sources. The other thing is which sources do you do? Um, and that is a little bit more complicated because it depends on how many sources per field. It depends on how faint they are. It depends on the distribution of LBCS calibrators per field. And so I think what we need is probably to process about 50 or so pointings um, to really optimize the pipeline and really understand what sources we can specifically do um, before, we, before we fine tune uh, the source selection. But if you do have ideas um, for, for sources that you would be interested in, please please do get in touch. Okay, thanks. 
uh, I have another one actually. Um, you mentioned and you showed one LBA image done with the international yeah. stations. Um, is there a plan or is there already a pipeline for that as well? Or is that done more like manually? Um, so this was done manually because Christian is working on uh, very bright 3C sources. So um, you can actually do self calibrations very in a very straightforward way. Um, when your sources are bright enough that you have good signal to noise. Um, for fainter sources, uh, the pipeline that we've designed is actually very similar to the calibration strategy I used to image 4C4315, um, excuse me, with the LBA. And so there's nothing that's been designed out of that. Uh, so the pipeline should, in theory, work on LBA data as well. Um, there's been a couple of initial tests, but no one has really taken a project and run with it uh, using the pipeline to get science quality results yet. But in theory, it should work for, for, the, uh, for the LBA as well. Great, thanks. The last question is from Eric Kozinga asking, what is the advantage of making a single wide field image versus making cutouts of the all interesting sources? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, and the, the advantage is that it's a discovery space. Um, so if you make a wide field image and you're increasing the sensitivity um, across the entire image as compared to just doing it with a Dutch array, then you can start to see uh, fainter sources. They're probably going to be point sources, but it gives you more information on, on the sources that are there because you just see more sources. Whereas if you're doing postage stamp images, you might miss those faint sources that would pop up um, in between the sources that you're, you're doing postage, postage stamp images of. Okay, many thanks, Leah. Um, then we, I think we go on. Okay. The next speaker, Melanie can't be presenting. So we have Philip Best. Morning. Um, Morning. Yeah, talking about the loads deep fields. Shall I give you a warning at 15 minutes? Yes, that'd be great. Um, okay. Please can you ahead. see that okay? Yep. Okay, perfect. So um, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for inviting me to give this talk here today. Um, very happy to talk to you about the deep field work that we're doing with uh, with LOTS. So Leia has already outlined um, the capabilities of LOFAR at, at the high angular resolution, and obviously that's an ambition for us to do in deep fields as well, but the uh, the work I'm going to be presenting today is just at the at the lower angular resolution of the Dutch stations only with uh, with LOFAR six arc second resolution, and it's done in collaboration with the LOFAR Surveys Key Science Project. I particularly like to give credit to uh, to a few people who've been uh, instrumental in making this happen. On the radio side, uh, Cyril Tass, who's developed a lot of the um, the radio imaging techniques we have. Uh, Tim Shimwell, Pepe Sabata, and Martin Hardcastle have been key to, uh, to actually link us process all of these data. And then on the multi-wavelength side, my PhD student in Edinburgh, Rohit Kondapali, and Ken Duncan, who's been doing the photometric redshifts, and, and Martin as well, also on that multi-wavelength side. So let me, let me start by just uh, giving you an outline. I think lots, many people will, uh, will, will know about the LOTS wide survey, which is the aim to carry out a, a survey of the whole northern sky, at 150 megahertz reaching below 100 microjanskis per beam RMS. This was described in a paper by Tim Shimwell in 2017, and the first data release uh, of that survey came out in 2019, just 2% of the sky, 424 square degrees but already 325,000 sources and reaching indeed well below the target, although it was the optimal declinations of 70 microjanskis per beam. And as Leia's highlighted, six arc second resolution, but we hope to reprocess that at 0.3 arc second resolution eventually. And because uh, over the whole sky, there's the imaging quality is, is obviously getting better over time, but it's still not as good as in specific well-studied fields. It's deep enough to get optical or near IR identifications for about 72% of the, uh, the host galaxies. With the lots deep fields, what we're aiming to do is go considerably deeper than this in a subset of the sky, about 50 square degrees going a factor uh, five or so or more deeper. So reaching our target of about 10 microjanskis per beam at 150 megahertz, this is being carried out in the fields with the best degree scale multi-wavelength data available so that we can get much more 
information about the host galaxies of the radio source. And the 50 square degree area is set because we want to have sufficient sky area at high redshift to be probing all environments right the way from uh, voids through to the richest of clusters and also to build up a sufficient sample size for statistical studies. And the depth is sufficient to detect Milky Way galaxies out to about a redshift of one and Starburst or, or AGN, even low power radio AGN out across most of the, uh, the history of the universe. So the first data release of this came out last month on, on archive, uh, two papers by Tass and Sabata outlining the, the radio imaging, a paper by Kondapali on the optical cross matching and one by Duncan on the uh, photometric redshifts and a few science papers. And that's what I'm gonna try and give a bit of a summary of uh, in this talk. So, uh, we're primarily observing four uh, northern extragalactic fields. That's Bootes, Elias M1, Lockman Hole, and the, the North Ecliptic Pole. And we're building up a considerable amount of data with repeated observations in these fields. By the, this time next year, we should be at 500 hours of data in, in Elias M1. Uh, the first data release uh, obviously drew a line at some point where we made the radio catalogs and started all of the cross batching. That included 80 hours in Bootes, 164 in Elias M1, and just over 100 hours in Lockman. And this reaches us uh, in Elias M1 within a factor two of our ultimate target depth. We were down at 19 microjanskis per beam, a little bit uh, less, less deep in, in Lockman Hole and, and Bootes. But in total, we're detecting more than 100,000 sources. And in the central regions where the optical imaging is, is the best, there's about 80,000 sources that, that coincide with that optical near infrared and, and spits of imaging. And the source density here in Elias M1, it's 33,000 sources in that central region over seven square degrees. So this is about 5,000 sources per square degree, seven times the, the source density of the, the LOPS wide survey. To put this into context with other radio surveys, this is the sort of standard plot of survey area against RMS depth. I think the simplest comparison to make is with the VLA uh, Cosmos 3 gigahertz survey, where we're effectively probing down to about the same RMS uh, level for a spectral index of, of 0.7, but over an order of magnitude more uh, sky area. This gives you an indication of the data quality. So this is the Elias M1 field. So LUFAR covers the entire field in a single uh, single pointing. And, uh, and as I say, we're just re repeating that pointing and going deeper and deeper. So there's 80,000 sources in this image. What you see is little bits and pieces, blobs in there, uh, none of its uh, noise. If we zoom in on that, um, you can see all of these objects, uh, all of these objects coming out, uh, mixture of AGN, star forming galaxies, uh, the, whole, the whole works in there. And to give you an idea of what the extra depth gives, this is an interesting region of the image that we, we originally christened the fireworks region because it looks like there's a lot of things going off from the, from the center. This is a LOTS level depth for, for eight hours. And this is what you get in the LOTS deep image after 164 hours. So you can see vastly more detail on the extended sources, but a massive number of extra point sources coming through as, as well. So the radio data alone provides limited science. Obviously, we're critically dependent on the multi-wavelength data to provide the host galaxy identifications, to provide the source classifications. Is it star forming galaxies in AGN? To get some indication of the redshift, which will let us then get photometric, uh, get us properties of the galaxy like the luminosity, the mass, the star formation rate, and all of these things. So you need the multi-wavelength data for, for this. And Lockman, Bootes, and Elias M1 have very deep multi-wavelength data over about 10 square degree regions, running from the optical, right the way through the optical bands, to the near infrared, in the Spitzer bands as well, out through the mid infrared, and into even into the Herschel bands, these well-studied fields with Herschel in the far infrared. And so what we've done, which was led by uh, PhD Robert Kondapali, was to, to take all of the existing imaging for these fields and to, to um, pixel match it and perform matched aperture forced photometry on all of the catalogs so that we have uniform catalogs across the field. And this is then what we used for the optical identifications and then photometric redshift. 
the identifications, we followed a process similar to the one that's been uh, was followed for the, the DR1 of the wide lot survey and has been used also by other radio surveys. So we made a mix of uh, automated statistical techniques where possible. So in particular, the, uh, the likelihood ratio technique, which is based on the, the magnitudes and in our case, also the colors of the host galaxies and their distances from the objects, both to select the best possible host for any radio source, but also to be able to statistically assess whether it was a, a likely host or, or not. Where this wasn't possible, more extended radio sources, we used uh, an internal low far galaxy zoo project where the images were eyeballed by at least five people who gave assessments on how to associate uh, extended or multi-component sources together and identify the host galaxy. And this process also picked up many blended sources without the depth where we're actually beginning to see some confusion in the images and sources needed to be to be de blended. And one of the I think one of the keys for this is every source, we got a very high identification fraction, about 97% of the objects came out of this process with an identification. And that also meant that the numbers that were left without an identification were relatively um, relatively manageable. And so every single object then that didn't have an identification was vis uh, visually inspected to ensure a, a robust outcome. This gives you some indication of the host galaxy properties of the sources. So this is just a plot, a histogram plot of the magnitudes of the sources uh, in different wave bands. So running from the bluest wave bands, the U band in the, uh, the blue end of the optical is up in the top left corner down to the 4.5 micron band in the, in the bottom right corner. And uh, the three different colors on here, the black line is for our full sample. The sort of pinky uh, color is uh, cut at one millijansky, uh, 150 megahertz, and the blue cut is at 10 millijansky. And the numbers that you see just below the filters, this is the fraction, the total fraction detected in these bands. So you can see that in the bluest bands, for example, we're getting 50, maybe 60% of the identifications. And you can see that we're still rising, hitting the peak of the histogram about at our magnitude limit. So there's lots of objects that we don't have the sensitivity to detect. But at the reddest bands, for example, 4.5 micron bands, you can see the peak of the magnitude distribution is, is much brighter than the magnitude limit of the survey. With identifying almost all of the, the sources. And as you go to the brighter radio fluxes, you also see that this pushes up even more towards the brighter magnitudes. So as we're going fainter, we're bringing in a population of, of slightly bluer, fainter objects, which is the emergence of the star forming galaxies and the uh, radio quiet quasars that you might expect. In terms of photometric redshifts, uh, we've got accurate photometric redshifts for all of the sources in the field. This is a paper by Ken Duncan, where he's used his technique of optimizing a, a hybrid between template models and, and machine learning. And you can see here for the three fields, um, split into the objects which are best fit by a template, uh, a galaxy-like template. And those, uh, those are the three panels at the top. And the three panels at the bottom for those that are best fit by an AGN like template. What you can see is that the photometric redshifts are reasonably reliable out to about redshift one and a half for the galaxies, then begin to get a bit noisier. But for the AGN, we're actually reliable to at least redshift of three and, and pretty reliable even out to redshifts of, of five or so. And the plot on the lower right just shows the range of parameter space we're studying in a, a luminosity redshift. Plot. And you can see that at, at most of the redshifts, we've got a wide range of luminosities that we, we cover. We've been classifying the sources, uh, classifying into four classes. So uh, star forming galaxies, radio loud, AGN, which is split into the two populations of sort of quasar-like or HERGs and, and uh, jet mode or, or LERG AGN. And then also the radio quiet AGN, the objects that would traditionally be classified as radio quiet, but we have sufficient sensitivity in these deep fields to be detecting them. I don't have time to go into the details of that uh, classification. The papers, it's all been done, the papers being, being written up. Um, but in, what we've actually done is used a variety of spectral energy distribution fitting packages, MAGFIS, SIGAL, MAGPIPES, AGM fit, uh, some of which are optimized for fitting uh, 
primarily galaxy-like templates, and some of which include AGN models in there. And using the comparison between the outcomes of these different models, we've been able to fairly robustly pick out the objects which have AGM features in them, but also to derive consensus classifications, star formation rates, and, and masses uh, from these. And the, uh, the lower right plot just shows an example of radial luminosity against star formation rate, where most things are reasonably well correlated because they're star forming galaxies. And you can see the radio excess objects coming up with excess radio emission due to the AGM example. To give you an idea of the breakdown of our sample in Elias M1 out of uh, the central region, just over 30,000 sources, about two thirds of them are star forming galaxies, 10% radio quiet AGN, about 15% to uh, jet mode or lurg like radio AGN and a small proportion of, of quasar like AGN and uh, about 3% unclassified. To show you some of those, how the source populations change, this just demonstrates the different source populations as a function of, uh, of 150 megahertz flux density. So you've got the four populations that I talked about, the star forming galaxies, the radio quiet quasars, lurgs and, and hercs. The shaded regions represent the, uh, the sort of statistical uncertainties um, based on, on just Poisson statistics. So no uh, uh, cosmic variance drawn in across the different fields here. The opens, the, the little individual symbols are for the three individual fields, which indicate that across the three fields, they're broadly consistent with the, uh, the results we're getting. And you can see the expected result here that uh, at faint uh, fluxes, you're dominated by a star forming galaxy population. If you go brighter, it's mostly the lurgs, and the very, very bright luminosities, the hergs, are coming in. And there's a population of radio quiet quasars which come in around a, a millijansky or so, it's subdominant but, uh, but not negligible. And we can do similar analysis as a function of, of the, the luminosity, as a function of the stellar mass, the magnitude, the redshift, and all of these give, uh, give the expected um, behaviors, which is, uh, which is encouraging. So let me just um, sort of finish by giving you some sort of quick science results that are coming out of it. Um, and this is just an idea to give you a flavor. There's many different science analyses going on. Uh, here, for example, are the source Sorry, counts. Sorry, you have three minutes to go. Perfect. Uh, here are the source counts across the, the different fields uh, compared to various models. There's a good degree of consistency with the literature. But actually, if you look at fluxes uh, below a few millijanskis, we actually see a little bit more of a, of a dip and a more enhanced star formation population below a, a millijansky than is, is being found in previous studies. And we're still working to investigate that. Uh, and this is being presented in a paper by, by Jip Mandal. And then Martin Hardcastle has done an analysis of these source counts and what contribution that makes to the 150 uh, megahertz um, background high temperature. And it comes out at about 44 Kelvin. And interesting, this is, despite this great depth that we're getting to, this is significantly below the results coming out of RK2. So there's still some, uh, some conflict there. We've looked at the, uh, the, the relation between radio luminosity and star formation rates, work by Dan Smith, that's also out on archive, using about over 100,000 galaxies at redshift less than one in a mass selected sample, found a, a good linear relation between star formation rate and radio luminosity that doesn't seem to evolve with, uh, with redshift, but does seem to have uh, strong evidence for uh, albeit weak, but non-negligible stellar mass dependency, which breaks a little bit the, the calorimeter model for star forming galaxies. So that's another interesting result. Um, we've looked at using the classifications, the evolution of the jet mode population. This is a paper in preparation by, uh, by Konda Paliadal. Out to redshift two and a half, uh, there's actually relatively little evolution in, this, uh, in, in these jet mode AGM, which is really quite surprising, given that these are um, thought to be hosted by passive galaxies. And out there's a very strong negative evolution of the space density of those potential hosts beyond redshift one but the space density of the radio AGN doesn't fall off in the way expected. So this is, again, interesting work that's going to need, uh, need more detailed look. 
We can look at variable sources because we come back to the image again and again and again. We can make individual images from each night of observation and the data products that we released have that. And this is able to identify particularly large numbers of, of slow variable sources. The image on the left shows the most variable source between uh, cycle two data, which were, were about half the data in ELISA and one were taken one year, half a year later in cycle four. Uh, and there's some, some, this is the most extreme example of a, of a variable source and the paper in, in preparation on, on that as well. And, and finally, um, another thing that's in the data set are polarization products. So Q and U data, data cubes for each observation at both 20 arc seconds and 4.3 arc minute re uh, resolution. And Noelia herrera Ruiz has, uh, has aligned and stacked these individual nights of polarization data in, in Elias M1, reaching just over 20 microjunsky RMS and detected a surface density of, uh, of one polarized source per 1.6 square degrees. And quite surprisingly, including three FR1 sources, which were you know, the polarization detection of those at these low frequencies is, uh, is very interesting. So this hopefully just gives you a flavor of the things that we can, uh, we can do with these deep fields. So in summary, I think I want to say that LOFAR is, is capable of imaging to really great depths with the HVA. <clears throat> We're already down at 20 microjunskies per beam. We've got data to go considerably deeper. This is well down into the star forming population. And these deep fields in the, the best studied regions of the northern sky are opening a, a vast science potential. Um, post galaxy identifications for a very large fraction of the sources of the big sky area covering all environments. And I hope I've given you a flavor of the wide range of science coming. And I think this is also only just the start because uh, next year, the Weave Lofar Spectroscopic Survey will start, which is going to take spectra of all of the sources in these deep fields. And that spectroscopic information will just add yet further science. So I'll leave it there and thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Philips. Um, are there questions? I don't see any written in the question and answer session, so please. If anyone has questions, please go ahead. In the meanwhile, I have one. Um, is there any perspective of having in-band in -band spectrum for these sources? Yes, so this is one thing I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't mention. Um, so I'll stop the share so that I can, I can see people. Um, this is one thing that I, I didn't mention as well. Um, so we have imaged, this, again, one of the data products, we've imaged these in three different frequency bands across the, uh, across the low far bands. Those, uh, those do allow a measurement of an in-band spectral index. For the brighter sources, we're able to compare that with a, an external spectral index to, the, um, to MBSS, for example, or to other higher frequency um, surveys and there's a good correlation between the two. Obviously, there's a degree of, of scatter um, because you've got a very narrow frequency range uh, you know, from a, 120 to 170 megahertz or so. It doesn't give you a, a big dynamic range. And, uh, and for the fainter sources, there's a lot of scatter. But it is sufficient to be able to detect, for example, inverted sources which have a steep spectrum between MVSS and uh, and low far when they're then inverted in the in the low far bands. So there's uh, there's there's inf interesting information there as well. Okay, thanks. Great. Any more question for Philip? I just got a quick question, Philip. Uh, Pepe's variable source. Uh, what is it? Uh, is it an AGN? Uh, have you traced up the multi wavelength stuff? The multi wavelength stuff suggests it's just a, a fairly bog standard AGN. So um, so yeah, no, that's so, an interesting one. I mean, we we're, we're trying to get to the bottom of. Quite so you think is. scintillation or intrinsic or you haven't done the numbers? It looks, in, I mean, it looks gradual. So we've done it across all of the, uh, all of the different uh, wave bands. It seems to be a gradual decline over, over time. So it does seem to be, yeah, something intrinsic. It's, uh, it's an unresolved source, so it could be quite compact. Um, this is, that was just the most extreme example. There are many, many objects that get picked up with long-term variability and actually surprisingly more, you've got to be quite careful with the way that the, uh, you know, to, to correctly pick out things that are statistically 
correct because of all of the challenges of the, the calibration of these different images, the flux, you can get a little bit of intrinsic flux variability um, just for yeah. the calibration effects. But, um, but there seems to be a significant number of genuinely variable sources, more than might be expected at these, uh, at these sort of time scales and, and flux ends. Let's go. Great. Okay, thanks again, Philip. I think we can move to the last talk of the session. So we have Austin, are you there? Oh, hi, Melissa. Ah, okay, great, hi. Okay, so the last talk of the session is Austin uh, Pumba. I hope I don't misspell your name. Uh, mm -hmm represent us an overview of the hydrogen intensity and real-time analysis experiment. You have 18 minutes, um, 17 minutes, sorry. So shall I give you a warning after 15? Uh, yeah, that's fine, thanks. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay, um, uh, yeah, hi, hi everyone, um, my name is Austin. Um, I'm a master's student from the University of Barcelona Natal. So I'm going to give you a talk on my work. Um, based on the IRAX project, uh, so where I characterize um, and uh, integ and integrate uh, some of the IRAX instrument for us to have a fully functional system that meets the required specification. Um, I'm also going to give a talk um, on the IRAX overview. Um, um, on, I'm also going to give a talk on the overview of the IRAX project on, on the behalf of the IRAX collaboration. So IRAX is currently col collaborating with both locals and um, inter international uh, institutions of, 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 for, for, for them to, for us to achieve some of the scientific goals. So um, this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to, uh, uh, to okay, uh, this is the outline of my talk. I'll give you an overview of the IRAX um, uh, project. We'll uh, take you through the science goals. And then I'll take you through the IRAX design specification. And then I'll, I'll discuss some of my work uh, that includes uh, uh, performing some, uh, some LNA, LNA and RF over fiber characterization and system integration. Uh, so the primary science goals for IRAX is, IRAX is, to, um, is to measure BAOs uh, using 21 centimeter intensity mapping. Um, um, to, to constrain dark energy, uh, and also um, IRAX plans to uh, study radio transients and uh, radio transient pulses, and um, and also another uh, a key uh, science project is to localize uh, FRBs. So we all know that the universe uh, the universe is uh, the universe is uh, expanding uh, at an uh, the universe expansion is ex uh, is accelerating. And uh, what causes this uh, acceleration is dark energy. But what is uh, what remains mysterious to date is the nature of this dark, dark energy. So IRAX is a new uh, radio interferometer, interferometer project to be located at the Karoo, planning to precisely um, uh, uh, measure the late expansion history of the universe. Uh, so they'll do. Uh, so we'll do this by. Um, by um, measuring the uh, BOS, uh, BOS um, uh, we'll do this by measuring the baryonic acoustic oscillation uh, using 21 centimeter intensity mapping uh, technique. So these BOS are uh, fluctuations in the density of uh, matter. Um, uh, uh, BOS are uh, fluctu fluctuations in the density of baryonic matter. And they have a characteristic scale of uh, 150 per sec that can be used to map uh, the expansion history of the universe. So since since we want to uh, survey a large volume of, of the sky, uh, but uh, uh, counting individual uh, galaxies is quite uh, um, is is quite challenging and difficult. Uh, so we'll uh, trade off a resolution uh, for us to uh, me uh, measure the BL scales. This is the artistic impression of IRAX when it will be fully instrumented um, with 1,024 dishes. So the IRAX instrument is actually um, uh, determined by the BL uh, uh, science requirements. So for us to achieve a, um, um, achieve a, um, higher sensitivities on the BL scales, we need a cl closely packed uh, array. Uh, and also for us to, um, 
to for us to capture the dark energy uh, domination at a rate shift of two uh, uh, rx plans to operate af at a frequency range of 400 to 800 megahertz so for us to uh, resolve the bios uh, scales um within the redshift of 0.8 to 2.5 we need a, a minimum a baseline of 15 to 60 meters and uh, since the bio uh, signal are very weak in the range of uh, 0.1 millikelvins we need a low system temperature and a large collecting area uh, this is the um, um, IRAX instrument as design specification. So the number of dishes we are looking at is 1, uh, 1,024. Uh, we'll use the observation type, type, type will be a drift scan where we'll use the rotation of the earth to make observation. Um, we plan to have, a, uh, we, want, we, we plan to achieve a system temperature of 50 kelvins uh, and our dishes should be, uh, should have a focal ratio of 0.25. So the sensitivity we are looking at here is 12 microyanskis. Uh, this is the current uh, IRAX dish installation at our trial. So we currently have eight uh, commercial off-the-shelf uh, satellite dishes uh, with a fo focal ra uh, ratio of uh, 0.38 uh, in the uh, in the um, in the foreground, we have, uh, okay, that's uh, one, one custom made uh, fiber glass, glass that has a focal ratio of uh, 0.25. Then in the foreground, uh, that's uh, an aluminum dish with the, the uh, dozen focal ratio of 0.25. So that's the, uh, the green structure you can see over there. That's uh, the control room. Um, uh, that's our control room. So for the final uh, dish, um, for the final dish, uh, uh, this these are some of the requirements that we need. So the uh, the dish should be uh, six meter in diameter. The focal ratio should be 0.25, uh, so, uh, so that it can minimize the cross coupling between neighboring di dishes, and also the dishes should be um, um, uh, rigid and stable uh, and uh, uh, wind load, so that we can achieve a high level of uh, uh, baseline redundancy. Uh, the dishes should be um, is easily uh, as should be uh, should be able to be easily assembled with uh, two or one or one individual, and also it should be cost efficient. So um, that's the front end electronics, uh, an artistic impression uh, uh, where the front end electronics will be located at the antenna. Because the BL scales uh, we're looking at are, are, are weak and um, sensitive, so we need to uh, we, we we need to assess our sites. So um, these are some of the RFI characterization we performed at uh, two sites. That's at trial where we are currently, and also uh, we performed RFI measurements at uh, the SK site. Basically, that's at Sort for Ten. Um, you can see there's a big contrast between these two uh, sites. Uh, so the uh, the SK site has a relatively low RFI uh, uh, as compared to uh, the uh, as compared as compared to the atrial site within the RX uh, band of interest. Um, this is the RX analog uh, signal chain. Uh, so the signal is uh, the, the the signal is det detected by the feed. And then the LNA sets our sensitivity and uh, noise temperature. Uh, and also further amplification happens in the second stage. And then the RF of fiber transport the signal from the dish into, uh, into, our, uh, in, into our control room where we have a RF, RF of fiber receiver that converts the optical signal back, back, into, back into an RF signal. Then this is fed into an ice pod, which performs uh, digitization and correl correlation and the GPU um, correlates the signal uh, to form uh, uh, for beam formation. Uh, this is a RX active feed. Uh, so the material is um, the material uses an FR4, and that's the baseboard. That's where most of the um, power regulation happens. And then that's a global leaf uh, petal, an uh, petal antenna. So the stem board supports the the uh, Petrol antenna and the baseboard, 
and uh, our LNA, the LNA is located at the stem. Uh, that's it's, uh, it's um, okay. The LNA is also RFI, RFI shielded. So the LNA we are using is differential and it's uh, integrated into the antenna. So one key importance with this is it improves the system temperature and also it uh, it provides a dynamic range. So this is a current uh, a current RF of fiber receivers that we have. So one good thing with this um, setup is we can actually stack 16 of the RF of fiber receivers into this uh, U1 uh, into this uh, U1 uh, U1 box. Um, this okay. We are using a, a the type of fiber we are using is a single mode, and the laser uh, that we're using uh, has a wavelength of 1310 um, nanometer. So we went for uh, Fabry Perot uh, lasers because they are low, they are, uh, because they have, uh, they have a low cost and they also provide a good performance for, for a short range of application. Uh, so, so the reason we're using fiber is for, is for cost efficiency and um, uh, also uh, fiber has a low attenuation. And it also, it's also less bulky and also it's, so it's, it isolates your your front end and the back end electronics in case of um, lightning, light, lightning strikes. So one of the key reasons for us to perform this uh, characterization on the uh, IRAX front end is we need to understand the, some of the performance of, uh, of, of, of our instru instrument in terms of the RF parameters. So one key parameter that we're looking at is the S parameter. And the mode of measurements that we actually perform is using a vector network analyzer. So some of the measurements that we perform is a reflection coefficient and gain. So we do this to actually determine the degree of impedance match, amplification, and band redefinition. Another key parameter, another key uh, param, uh, parameter here is linearity. So the mode of measurements that we can actually perform is using um, a spectrum analyzer. And one uh, the figure of merits that we're looking uh, at is a third order intercept and a one dB compression point. So this uh, determines the linearity and dynamic range of, uh, of our amplif amplifiers. Uh, so the, this, um, uh, this, is, this is an S parameter measurement of the LNA um, board. So there's a, a 10 dB can uh, negative slope uh, on our gain. Um, um, and also you can see there's also poor input match, but uh, this, is, uh, this, this is actually expected because the LNA is much for noise. And there's a good uh, output uh, match, which is greater than 15 dB. Uh, these are the uh, LNA linearity measurements. Uh, when we sent a two signal, a two tonal signal at a frequency of 598 and uh, 603 megahertz, and uh, <clears throat> the measured uh, output IP3 was uh, was uh, was measured to be 29 dBm. Uh, we also performed the 1 dB compression point, and uh, that was measured to be. Uh, around 19 dBm within the RX uh, 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 band of interest. So um, this uh, this is the RF or fiber um, S parameter measurement. So there's a, there's a 10 dB gain variation. That's so, uh, so that we can compensate for the 10 dB uh, variation from the, from the LNA. And also we achieved uh, the input uh, return losses um, is, 10, is more than 10 dB and the output match is also uh, greater than 15, which is also good for us in terms of um, um, matching purposes. Uh, we performed um, RF, uh, we performed uh, noise figure measurements on the RF over fiber units um, uh, using a spectrum analyzer that has got uh, noise figure measuring capabilities. Uh, that's the measurement, uh, I'm sorry, the the figure doesn't look clear here, but uh, uh, the noise figure measurement and at uh, the center frequency is uh, seven point five uh, dB. Uh, so these, um, so these, uh, the, the noise figure is quite high because um, because um, the RF of fiber link is degraded by the relative in intensity noise of the laser. 
are there uh, on your right that's the gain response of the laser and the photodiode link um uh, the okay where the the, the gain there is uh, around is my, around minus 16 db uh, minus 16 dbs so that is ex, uh, that actually tells you why there is actually a higher uh, noise figure uh, uh, measurements on the rf of fiber link uh, this also the some of the um, output IP3 uh, and compression point measurements on the RF of fiber uh, unit. So the output uh, IP3 is was measured to be around 24 dBm, and the output 1 dB compression point was was is greater than 10 10 dB 10 dBm across the RX uh, um, band of interest. Commission is in progress. Um, so we instrumented uh, the RF over fiber unit and, and the active uh, antenna on the on the fiberglass um, dish. Uh, but um, um, uh, so um, at the moment um, we were not able to uh, obtain the beam. Uh, we were not we we were not able to obtain uh, a beam um, information on on the on this autocorrelation plot this is basically uh, due to the effect of rfis so we plan we plan to uh, make modification of, on our signal chain so that we can actually get uh, some information of the of the antenna of the antenna beam so this is uh, the modified rf over fiber signal chain so one of the key thing that we actually uh, uh, changed on the signal chain is uh, we uh, added uh, we, uh, we added a cascaded uh, bandpass filter and also some attenuation pad. So the reason of actually doing this was we wanted to uh, re, uh, eliminate uh, some of the out of band RFIs um, and also uh, the, the the pads uh, in, improve the input and output output much of your bandpass filter. Another thing we also uh, sort of uh, plan to do was we added an, a gain block. Um, this was to provide more amplification and also to achieve higher dynamic range. So with this new uh, modification, uh, we, we we plan to um, achieve, a, we, we plan to trade off a gain uh, so that at least we can have some, some meaningful uh, um, measurements of the beam. You have two minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, to summarize, to summarize my talk, um, we performed, uh, um, we, ca we characterized the LNS as parameter and we plan to use uh, other measurements to measure the differential LNA. So the LNA has a higher linearity, which is good for us. Um, we need to perform um, noise temperature measurements on the uh, differential LNA. Uh, we also, okay, we, we characterize the RF of fiber system, but we need to modify the circuit so that we can achieve a uh, linearity to uh, to higher um, uh, linearity. Um, also, another thing we need to perform gain and phase variation of, of the RF of fiber receivers due to temperature effects. Uh, some of the current development is um, we have secured uh, funding for um, for, for 256 antennas. And also, we plan to um, do more deployment. That's scheduled for early next uh, early next year, and then we'll do a deployment uh, at uh, for, for two tr prototype uh, dishes at Clarion Fontaine near SK site uh, for this uh, for the dish uh, qualification of qualifications uh, that is scheduled for mid 2021. Then we we'll pl we'll plan to build uh, eight element at Salt Fontaine near uh, the SK site uh, that is scheduled for late 20, 2021. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Okay, many thanks, Austin. Are there question, questions? Okay, so we have one. Uh, Michiel is asking, saying, great work. Uh, you preach much you pretty much answered all my questions while I typed them. <laughs> Which element becomes nonlinear first? Uh, 
which um, comes non linear first um yeah so uh, that's a good question thanks um so basically uh yeah it's actually a uh, difficult because uh, it was it's difficult to tell which one is uh because uh so the lna has got two amplifiers okay let me just go through the yeah so we suspected the this uh this um this amplifier was going to uh, is okay we 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 expected this amplifier uh is experiencing some uh, gain blockage uh, so that's why we thought of maybe um adding uh doing this uh these changes that i just uh, described i don't know if that answers the question yeah i think so um otherwise michael please okay yeah uh the other question that michael has is uh, what is the dominant source of rfi digital tv cell phone yeah so um one one key thing that we uh i sort of spotted when doing this measurement um i i suspected the, the gcm signal i think cell phone uh, cell, cell phone uh, signal um that um uh, yeah i mean it's quite embarrassing we, that's a, a red, that's an uh, that's a radio uh, observatory uh, site but yeah we we still do ex experience some uh, some uh, signal interference basically on the cell phones okay any more question roasting okay so franz kirsten is asking is there any collaboration with hera uh, uh no i think um yeah because Hera and irax are two different uh projects uh like because uh, we we era is um, yeah this uh, I, I, I don't think so unless yeah but uh, I think some of there's some of the era people who also do help, help us with uh, uh, actually analyzing some of the data maybe in future it might be but these are two different projects okay. Unless there are any other questions. Okay, Franz was saying, I guess my actual question is, what is the difference between the two? So between Hera and higher, higher, how we call it, yeah. Also, Hera is uh, trying to probe uh, the epoch of um, uh, reanalyzation and uh, um, IRAX with our plan is uh, we're we trying to um, um, measure um, BOs to understand the nature of uh, dark energy, and even I mean even from the frequency of uh, of frequency uh, of, of of operation also different. This also um, this also like this translate to what you have or, or your redshift because uh, the error uh, redshift is also different from from the from era. So yeah. Okay, good. Okay, thank, thanks, Austin, and thanks, everyone. Uh, don't forget, we have a coffee session right after the session that is now finishing. So, oh, thanks. thanks, everyone. And the session is continuing, uh, well, in the afternoon for me or in the morning for some of you. And yeah, it was great to, to hear your talks. So, see you hopefully at the coffee session.